Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're talking about the various elements of grace and the work of salvation, and today we'll talk about the unredeemed state of human beings. Now, this is a state that neither you nor anyone you know have ever needed to deal with or experience. It's the state that people were in between the fall of Adam and the death of Jesus Christ, and it's one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest, that mankind has ever had. As we talked about last episode, human beings had lost both their immortality, their imperviousness to bodily harm, and the purity of their normal inclinations, their resistance to spiritual harm. However, these were a consequence of original sin and not really a symptom of man's unredeemed state per se. After all, we still have mortality and temptations to sin, and we have been redeemed. The really devastating consequence of living in the unredeemed state was that no matter what, you were tainted with the stain of sin, personal sin and also original sin. This means that you could never be united to God fully in heaven. It wouldn't matter if you'd spent your whole life as a Mother Teresa, caring for the poor and needy. Heaven was too high a goal to aspire to because that would involve perfection, which just wasn't open to human beings. Yes, God had set up the old law of the Israelites to encourage them in holiness, but it wasn't useful for bringing people into heaven, as it says in the book of Hebrews. For it is impossible that with the blood of oxen and goats, sin should be taken away. Hebrews 10.4 So we know the old law wasn't used for bringing people to heaven. So, in that case, what was its purpose, if not for the salvation of souls? I've heard some people say that the purpose of the old law was to remind the people of Israel of the horrible, disgusting nature of sin. The animal sacrifices they needed to perform according to the law were grotesque, bloody, smelly affairs, which made it basically impossible to hide what kind of sin you'd committed from those around you. I'm sure that at least part of the purpose was, in fact, to remind people of the gravity of sin, but also, I think, it was probably to give people lesser goals of goodness to aspire to than heaven in the short term. Now, here's the big question. Does this mean that good and holy people from past ages lose their souls despite spending years struggling to do the will of God? Did King David go to hell for setting up the death of Uriah or Moses for killing the Egyptian slave driver when he was a young man? If your perspective were that only heaven and hell are possible destinations in the afterlife, then it would be hard to claim they didn't. Then, however, you'd have to explain this. And after six days, Jesus taketh unto him Peter and James, and John his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Matthew 17, 1-3 Moses and Elijah couldn't appear on earth to talk to Jesus if they were in hell, and even if they did, it's hard to imagine that a few hundred years in hell would have done anything to help their moods. In Old Testament times, when holy men like these are described as dying, the term usually used for their destination is the Hebrew word sheol. Now, unlike our understanding of hell, sheol is usually referred to as a place that didn't contain hate, envy, work, thought, knowledge, wisdom, or activity, rather like an actual grave. However, it was a place devoid of punishment as well. Some of the people of ancient Israel believed that everyone went to Sheol after death, whether good or evil, but if you'll forgive this, I'm going to trust the word of someone who knew quite a bit more about the afterlife than they did. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died, and he was buried in hell. And Abraham said to him, Son, remember that thou didst receive good things in thy lifetime, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is fixed a great chaos, so that they who would pass from hence to you cannot, nor from thence come hither. Luke six twenty two twenty five and 26 Jesus told this parable about the fate of those in the afterlife specifically to warn people what would happen if they didn't share good things with those who were in need. But my point is that even if you want to say this was just a story or whatnot, the story would have lost all of its purpose if there had been no difference between the fate of the just and unjust in the afterlife. Because of this, 
Catholic theological tradition has treated the bosom of Abraham as a separate location for souls to be sent, known as the Limbo of the Fathers, and here's how it works. Although the just couldn't be brought to heaven when they died, they could be kept free of punishment in this Sheol, or Limbo, or whatever you want to call it. However, they were still trapped there, and unable to advance further towards God because of their sins. When Jesus died on the cross, every human person, living and dead alike, was redeemed. And one of the first things Jesus did after that was to go tell them the good news that the just people who'd been in the limbo of the fathers could now go to heaven. Because Christ also died once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might offer us to God, being put to death indeed in the flesh, but enlivened in the spirit, in which also coming he preached to those spirits that were in prison. 1 Peter 3, 18-19 those spirits in prison were obviously not in heaven, which is not in any sense a prison, nor were they in hell, because unless you're planning on gloating about your victory over sin and death, there's not much point in preaching to the souls in hell. When Jesus died on the cross, he redeemed everyone and ended the ability of sin to keep us trapped and prevent us from reaching heaven in full union with him. Next time, we'll take a look at the state of redemption and how Jesus' work affected us. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.